online um, or uh, even um, say like in the breakout sessions or something along those lines. Uh, so I'm actually with a couple different organizations right now. Um, so f my, my main priority right now is actually with a, an online course for personal knowledge management called Building a Second Brain, uh, where we do a lot of similar things to library science, but on an individual level, which is kind of fun. Uh, I also just came back from Map Camp which is uh, a strategy conference that we just uh, put together. Um, I'm also associated with Unica Labs, and I used to work for uh, Cooper Keystone Library Network. Uh, so at, K at the KLM, that's where I got a lot of my experience in viewfind. Uh, so the caveat is that I don't have any skin in the game anymore. Um, but at the same time, I've had a lot of uh, experience just sort of assembling systems and putting them together and seeing how to make things work. Uh, what I do most of the time is actually solutions development, and so uh, given you know, what, whatever requirements or needs that you have at your local institution, how do you actually build a system, period? Uh, and so I, I consider Viewfind something uh, that I can sort of work within. Uh, the the uh, pop-up here keeps obscuring it, but I yeah. have a... Um, if you don't mind. Go ahead, go I right ahead. Yeah, actually. make that stop. <laughs> I don't know why it... Uh, since it's plugged into the wall, but there we go. Oh, Wonderful. Wi -Fi. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Wait, is Zoom still working? It's supposed to be using cable to Wi Fi. Let's see. Okay, uh, could someone just let me know if you can still hear us okay on the Zoom call? Hearing you okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, and so uh, if you ever want to get in touch with me, uh, you can hit me on the Twitters on the bottom right there. I'm Ben Mosier. And I'm always interested in talking about viewfind and, and related things. Uh, so I'm going to start out with a little bit of an introduction here. Uh, so I came back from MapCamp, which is about a strategy mapping technique called Wardley mapping. And so I'm going to I'm going to sort of lightly touch on that today a little bit. And maybe if anybody finds any interest in it, we can uh, take a look in, in the breakout rooms uh, or breakout groups. So largely, Wardley mapping is a strategy, uh, approach to strategy for anyone with a pencil and uh, some paper, uh, but there are a lot of different ways to go about it. Uh, the, the main principle, uh, doctrinally speaking, is to actually start from real needs. So who are our users and what do they need from us? This is a really great way to center yourself on a problem space. Uh, so this is one of the things that um, I'm really learning over the last few years is important. Uh, it all starts with the user and their needs. Uh, and so what we do with worldly mapping is basically we start assembling this system of dependent needs uh, and what those needs need in order to actually be fulfilled. Uh, and so each of these edges, each of these connections is actually just a dependency relationship. So the user has needs, there are certain activities that have to happen underneath in order to fulfill those needs, and we kind of build this large system uh, until we understand the problem space. And what we see basically is that, vertically speaking, certain things are more visible to the user than others. Uh, and I'll sort of get into a more specific example here related to viewfind. So this is a hyper simplification uh, and, and not at all complete. But we can say that one of our users is a patron and uh, for viewfind, and one of their needs is to search and to discover. Another is to, say, create lists of books. Another might be to check availability on those books and so on. Uh, and we could go a step further and say there are a bunch of things that we need to have in order to actually fulfill those needs. So these can be things like connection to the ILS, uh, having a database, having a search index, um, and underneath it all is uh, some sort of hosting system, uh, which might be a, like a physical server or something like it. There's an additional dimension that I'll, I'll touch on lightly uh, and then sort of follow through on more like a narrative form, uh, which is evolution. And so each of these activities that happens is actually at a particular stage of evolution. Uh, how well developed it is, what kind of characteristics it has, uh, and that can tell us certain things. And so this is gonna be kind of like a story about how I uh, one day had a eureka moment and was like, wait a second. Uh, one of these things might be more evolved than we think it is, and that, mean, that might mean that we can do more than we think we can do right now. Um, so I'm going to sort of dive into that real quick. 
So, so evolution, uh, you can look at individual characteristics. And so I, one of my favorites is actually how uh, we think of failure in a particular stage of evolution. So there are four stages here, genesis, custom, product, and commodity. And how we treat failure in each of those stages is different. How we expect things to behave is different. So in, in genesis, which is the earliest stage of, of a development of an idea, think of like self-driving cars five years ago. Um, we expect things to fail. We tolerate it because we know that things aren't very well developed. And on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, when something is commodity, kind of like, think of like the power in the wall, uh, we, we've, we don't expect failure at all. In fact, it's surprising when it happens, uh, and it's usually because of catastrophic events that are completely out of our control as humans. And uh, there's this kind of range of things in between there, uh, which we can get more into if we want to talk about it later. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of these things. Uh, don't actually look at that slide. Um, the point is that there, there's a lot that, that, that is there that, can, that has been studied that we can look at. And so each of these characteristics changes depending on what stage of evolution a thing is in. So I want to talk a little bit about evolution of hosting as a practice, and in particular how that might affect how we treat viewfind. So in the beginning, uh, our approach to hosting is to have a physical server, and it's bespoke and artisanal. We handcraft it with love. We name it after something, uh, maybe our, a pet name or something like that. And what I really want to do is actually compare uh, two different perspectives, one from the startup world and one from the institutional world. And the reason I want to do that is because there's sort of been a theme that I've heard over and over, and it's the theme of trying to catch up and keep up to date with all the things that are happening. So I'm hoping this is going to be a little bit therapeutic um, so thinking about bespoke artisanal physical servers in the startup world, you know, you're renting space in a data center uh, when this was originally the case, um, or, or even thinking about building your own data center if you're getting into something really serious, you're renting or buying physical servers. And in the institutional space, you don't really have a choice about the renting aspect usually. And we're thinking like maybe five, ten years ago, just to sort of clarify the timeline here. Uh, and so you build your own data center or you buy physical, and you buy physical servers to put in that data center. And a lot of institutions have done that, uh, and at the Keystone Library Network, that was one of the things that we did. We became kind of like a center, central hub for that sort of thing. Uh, as things progressed, we started having this new technology called virtualization. So now we don't need one physical server per application stack, really. We have virtual servers on our, our physical servers. And this is pretty neat because it means that we can spend less money. Um, so, but in startup land, there's this kind of thing that happens. Startups basically get to start over from scratch because they're always ending and always beginning. And um, it's not as impactful right now. They can just rent or buy fus fewer physical servers. They still need a data center and all that kind of stuff. Institutions can't start over. Um, so they just buy fewer physical servers in the next uh, cycle and maybe they invest in some virtualization solution or something like that. But we're still handcrafting things uh, in that context. But now that servers can be virtualized and we can basically look at them as uh, kind of cheap, you know, to, to get a new one is to click a button and maybe change some configuration options in VMware or VirtualBox or whatever it happens to be. Um, sort of the game changes a little bit and in startup land, they get to start over, right? Because that's what they do. And they're saying, okay, what can we do now that we can treat these servers as if you know, the cost of getting a new one or throwing away an old one is actually pretty cheap? Uh, what if we treated servers as if they were disposable? Um, has anybody here heard of infrastructure as code? This, this is a really interesting thing, and, and I think we'll sort of see this theme. This is something that not a lot of people are doing in the institutional space. But in the startup space, it's, it's sort of like yesterday's news. Um, and it's, it, that's completely normal and fine. Uh, infrastructure as code, in the simplest way, is basically to say we write a manifest for a particular server type, and we define in the code how the server should be. Uh, so if you want to have a web server with Apache on it, um, I'll have a little <coughs> line, line in the code that says, I want an Apache server at this version. And um, I'm going to provide a template file for what the Apache configuration should be. And I'm going to check that into a code base. 
And so this is uh, interesting because it means that the server can actually automatically provision itself because it's pulling the way it should be from a defined set of code. When it starts up, it, it goes out and it says, okay, what should I be? Pulls down this code, oh, you want an Apache server at this version, okay, I'll install that. Uh, tools in the space are things like Puppet, Chef, CF Engine, uh, Ansible, and so on. Uh, but the server can basically configure itself. But it also can do something else, which is self-correct. So if you have things de well defined in code, uh, and someone accidentally goes in and, and changes something, or if the server crashes, or if something unexpected happens, a bug occurs, uh, in many cases, the system can basically self-correct and say, why is Apache 2.5 installed? I wanted 2.4, uh, or, or whatever it happens to be. And it's like, okay, I'm going to correct that. Um, which makes it pretty interesting because if you're a systems administrator coming in, you just want to SSH in and, and log in and make some changes, the, the code is actually going to take precedent. It's going to come over and overwrite all your changes. <laughs> so you can get into these interesting situations where you're like, but I want to just change this one thing. And the, and the system's like, no, no, you can't do that. Um, so the, the, the fun thing about this is that you can actually uh, like move on to a state where you're not logging into servers anymore and you're just making changes in the code and just watching it occur on the server. This is like pretty intense stuff. Um, but here's the thing, startups get to take advantage of it because they get to start over. Institutions can't start over, right? Uh, and they have more diverse systems than uh, startups do. And I'm gonna say that because I'm thinking back to Shippensburg University when I worked there and all the different kinds of things we had to run. Uh, like we, we could have easily had hundreds of different kinds of applications and so on. If you're a startup, you're probably doing one thing, right? And so that probably means the amount of different types of servers, like, oh, a web server and a database. That's all. Um, not a uh, web server and database for this application and web server and database for this other application. Institutions just have a much more difficult time because everything lives forever and they can't start over. And they have way, way different systems, all, all sorts of different systems happening at once. So the cost of change is super high. Um, so things progress. And we start seeing this cloud thing, right? Um, which I'm going to call utility compute. Amazon EC2 says, hey, you can send a web request to this endpoint, and I can give you a server for that. Like, that's, a, that's the way we can operate now. You don't need to actually buy or rent servers anymore. Um, so startups get to start over, right? Uh, no more physical servers at all. We don't buy those. Um, we basically rent these from whoever else is running them, so Amazon. They, this physical servers still exist, of course, but they're not mine. Um, and we can do interesting things like dynamic scaling, like uh, Amazon gives me an endpoint that tells me how much CPU usage my servers are, you, like where they're at right now. And I can write logic that says, oh, when they're at 40% or greater for more than 10 minutes, I can spin up 10 more of these things and add them to the load balancer and do a bunch of wonderful stuff. Um, I can just spin up a new system and test out something out for five minutes and then kill it. Like that's, that's a new kind of dynamic. Um, but then you go over to the institutional side of things that you can't start over, and cloud is a security risk because it's hard to get into that space and understand what's going on. And cost of migration is super high because, again, your diversity of, of applications is so great. You can't lift 75 different kinds of applications suddenly into the cloud and expect it to work out. Um, you have to be very careful about it. So, again, cost of migration is just really, really high. So there's, there's this theme happening. Things keep progressing, and institutions can't start over. Um, startups get to start over. So now platform as a service is a thing. Has anybody heard of Heroku? Uh, so the servers kind of go away. Um, developers aren't really thinking about them anymore. And so startups get to start over. No more servers. We just push our code base up to the, the whatever, and suddenly I have a, a thing deployed, and it's working. I don't have to think about servers. I don't have to log into anything. I don't have to manage it. Institutions, again, can't start over. None of our systems are built this way. I can't just go to this IBM product that I have for the specific student management system or whatever. I can't go to my ILS and say, hey, we're just gonna like use platform as a service now. It's not built that way. It's not built to take advantage of it because uh, the, the rate of change is so slow in, in this space. So now cost of change is actually impossible. Um, so this is getting better, right? <laughs> um, and now, like even looking into maybe the near future, uh, has anybody heard of Functions as a Service or Amazon Lambda? Um, it's getting even weirder, folks. Um, so, so now the question is, like, what's a server? 
it's now what's an app? Um, because now instead of building code bases, you could potentially write or borrow individual functions that do one single thing. Like, uh, for example, like get me all the results uh, for this geographical region. That's one function. Um, like that, that's, that's one thing, and then it's composed with other functions that all kind of come together to make this, okay, it's an app, but it's not the same kind of thing that we mean when we say app. Um, but institutions can't start over, and none of our systems are built this way, and now it's ridiculous and impossible. So uh, this is kind of like the progression of things that is normal in this space, and I want to say that that's okay, because there's really no choice here. Uh, and so this is the, the opinion that I'm going to assert, really. I said I wasn't going to assert any, but I'm going to. Um, it's unreasonable to expect institutions to keep pace with technology except through exceptional strategic play. And very few institutions need or uh, desire exceptional strategic play because you're not operating typically in sort of the capitalist space of startup land. And you just need to help students do things. Um, and so I'm going to sort of like try to change the, the narrative on this a little bit to say, Maybe uh, most institution, institutions need things to be provided to them as services and not given to them as more apps to run. So the relevance here and what I want to talk about next really is kind of viewfind as a service. Uh, thinking about things from that context and how viewfind could be a service provided to an institution instead of uh, an, a code base for them to run and figure out how to customize and all that fun stuff. Um, so a little bit more on the services point. Attributes of applications for institutions right now tend to be expensive. They tend to be really difficult to try out. Um, there tend to be really long evaluation cycles. Like we're thinking about evaluating a product in terms of how many years we have to run it until we're comfortable with it. Does that sound about normal? Um, they're difficult to maintain because you're often doing that work yourself. You might have support, but oftentimes there are differences between support. What support expects you to be doing and what you're actually doing. Um, you have to actually make things meet the needs of your local context. They do require serious technical know-how, which means you're hiring staff to do systems administration and technical things. Um, and yes, they're expensive. I'm going to say that twice because there are all sorts of different kinds of costs involved here in terms of who you can actually hire versus who you really want to hire, all that kind of stuff. And so the attributes of applications in this space tend to not be services. And that kind of is a, is a messy thing for us. Um, so how I got here was I was actually trying to figure out what to do with my life and what should I work on. Um, and I thought, well, I could, I could do this thing. Um, I was playing in the space a little bit, thinking about my experiences at the Keystone Library Network and how Viewfind operates. And I think I found a little pattern that might be useful. Uh, so oh, I could build a hosting service for Viewfind, um, which is easier said than done. But um, even though I decided not to follow that route all the way through, I thought sharing this idea might be really useful because someone out there might actually want to take this on and, and follow through. And I'll explain why that makes sense. So if I were to sort of summarize um, viewfind situation in terms of a map, uh, basically the patron needs viewfind. I'm going to really make that broad. We need to be able to manage the virtual machines and servers that run viewfind. And all those live in a data center. All that stuff is visible to each institution that attempts to run Viewfind, unless they're hiring a contractor to just take care of it and not like, pay attention to them at all. Um, what it actually kind of looks like is more like this, because you're dealing with records, you're dealing with the loading process, you have to deal with an iOS integration. All this other kind of stuff is happening. You have to index data and so on and so forth. Uh, don't like actually try to read this. It's just there's stuff here that we can get into. Um, but what I actually want to sort of assert is that it's actually possible to just look at it like this, that the patron needs a viewfind, and viewfind can run on a platform. And this is actually something that we experimented with and actually found a, a pretty great deal of success with, um, actually with Heroku, and uh, also with dockerization and containerization and so on. The stuff that was there before still exists, but we don't care about it anymore. Um, we don't. In this context, we don't think about logging into servers or managing data centers or any of that kind of stuff. Um, the impact of this kind of move, though, changes the game a little bit because uh, the, when it comes down to it, whenever you try to do it yourself or buy some sort of solution in the discovery solution space, um, it tends to be in the range of tens of thousands of dollars, either with uh, staff that you have to hire, 
um, or uh, like so people that you, you have to basically contract with or solutions that you try to consume. The licensing costs are pretty uh, difficult sometimes. But um, if you think about the, the raw infrastructure cost of running something in a platform, it's actually much reduced, especially if that's being provided to you as a service. So thinking about that, uh, if I'm looking at uh, the actual like, cost for the average institution, I went through and studied a bunch of institutions, including um, even the, the EI network in Allegheny County, and thinking about like what are the ranges of these sizes, how many records do they have, what kind of needs do they have, and I actually went through and like spec'd out what the, the literal hosting cost would be in, say, a Heroku context, uh, and it ends up being closer to about $1,000 a year. So if someone's providing this as a service and their cost is about $1,000 a year and they're competing against someone who is charging tens of thousands of dollars a year or uh, a situation that demands sort of like hiring people and so on, uh, the service model starts to look a little bit more attractive. Um, and with additional experimentation, so containers are an uh, interesting sort of technology, uh, there's even more cost savings to be had if someone goes down that route. Uh, so if we think about the service model, costs go down, it's kind of a race to the bottom, and it has some interesting effects. Uh, so the, why, why do we even bring this up now and think about it? Um, if you find we're offered as a service right now, that could actually serve as sort of a springboard for some interesting things in the institutional home space. Um, I don't know a whole lot about what's going on there, just, uh, so I'm just sort of speculating, but wouldn't it be interesting if a nonprofit were able to offer this as a service? Uh, there's some actually some pretty interesting sort of wiggle room that nonprofits have in that space. They can offer services for in exchange for money, which could actually fuel further development in addition to securing, in addition to securing grants and so on. Uh, so that can have some interesting effects. Um, there are also some open source models where there's a for-profit entity that is just doing something and then making uh, sort of benevolent contributions back into the project. And there's some, some governance models around that. Another thing is that viewfind adoption could actually be changed significantly with this. Um, if it's lower cost, then you're not going through the RFP cycle whenever you actually have to go buy a solution. Um, if it's, I'm gonna just use my credit card because it's under the limit uh, and I'm paying like 100 bucks a month, nobody's really gonna care about that. That changes the dynamic of what it takes to adopt a system. It also changes the dynamic of what it takes to try it out. Um, because it's so low cost, it would be pre pretty reasonable to offer free trials or to even uh, just say, just use your credit card for one month and see what happens. Um, it's easier to maintain because you're not actually responsible for the technical aspects of running a solar instance, running a web server, running all that kind of stuff because the platform largely takes care of that. It's not as simple as I'm making it out to be because again, you have to load records, you have to actually do things to maintain the system, you have to customize the interface and so on. Um, but there are, there, there are like basically plans for all those things that you can follow to make that easy, to make it reasonable in this space. Uh, so largely the goal is to basically say little or no technical expertise is necessary. Uh, if you actually want to customize your interface, just here, like, dump your CSS in here, and I think with some of the recent changes this actually gets easier. Um, the other thing is, so this is sort of the, the nerd part for me. Um, so when you have a race to the bottom in terms of cost for offering something like a discovery solution that has an interesting effect on the system, and when I say the system, I mean like the market of discovery solutions. And the Red Queen hypothesis is basically sort of part of evolutionary theory. Uh, if something gets really good uh, at, at surviving in this space, uh, and so I'm, I'm basically saying if ViewFund gets really cheap to run and to try out and adoption starts increasing significantly, that actually exerts pressure on the rest of the system, and I think in a really good way. Uh, hypothetically, increasing competition among the other providers and so on. I think nobody is going to complain about that kind of thing. So um, this is a number I threw out in the um, sort of talk proposal. 62% uh, of libraries around the world have not purchased and do not plan to purchase a discovery solution. Uh, and this is from a, a worldwide survey, sur sample size is almost 700. Uh, who knows if it's representative, but it kind of gives you an idea of maybe what's happening in the space. My question is why? Um, why don't they, is it either because there's no need or is it actually because it's really, really hard? Uh, and my gut says that it's actually really hard to run a discovery solution and to get into that space and to afford it and so on. And I think this, this could change if we offered this as a service. So that, that's what I have. Um, I'm interested in questions. I'm really interested in starting a discussion. Um, I'm gonna be around here for today and tomorrow. Uh, 
I've, I've gone down the route of actually doing this to the extent that there is code in the viewfind repository that is the version that works with Heroku, push the button, get a viewfind instance, some little caveats, some rough edges, like you have to still provision the database and run that script, but like all that stuff is automatable. And so there's a lot of stuff that's already in play and a lot of things that I've already thought about that could make this easy for someone to sort of pick up and run with. Uh, and so I know that's hard to do from the standpoint of an institution, but my hope is someone out there on the internet or even if you know somebody who's interested in this kind of thing, might go, hmm, I could do that. Uh, I'm interested in starting that discussion and even offering a lot of uh, the thoughts that I have already, um, all the work that I've already done. So, any questions? Yes. Why haven't you pursued it? Oh, uh, I ran out of money. <laughs> it's, it, to be completely blunt, and so I, my, my life actually pivoted a bit. Um, so I'm, I'm focusing more on some different things. So the personal knowledge man management side of things is more interesting to me right now. And I'm finding that my life is actually sort of more interested in that direction and less interested in running a hosting service as well. So I, I don't want to get into something sort of half-heartedly. I want to put my whole self into it. So now that I've, I'm actually at the point where I can actually think about doing things again, I'm going to still probably focus more on this higher level stuff instead of the, the lower level kind of technical things. Um, but I, I'm happy to help, actually. I'm happy to advise and offer everything that I have, all the work that I've done in that space. Yeah. Anybody online have questions? I have one comment. Uh, maybe, just maybe, the libraries don't get a discovery service because they don't realize they need one. Because That's a very good point. Old OBAC is quite all right, and uh, the old ways of doing stuff are quite all right. Yeah. And they don't see what the what the benefit of having a discovery interface is, and that, that's kind of kind of uh, similar to to just getting something as a discovery service, uh, as opposed to getting a full file, which is actually pretty good. Yeah. So my question for for you, I think, is. Do you think if they realize the value of having a discovery solution, they would want one? I think so. And they would want a, want a good one. Yeah, definitely. If you had like, a, for, for example, a side-by-side -side comparison between, between OPAX and a, an, an old OPAC and a good discovery interface. Right, right. Yeah, and, and what I think about in this context is, right now we could convince them that they need a discovery solution uh, or discovery service, and what's next for them? What, what do they actually have to do next? And the kind of status quo right now is go get a quote from someone, or try really, really hard to set this thing up, and you know, hop on the mailing list. Which I think, honestly, if you find his mailing list, thanks to Damien and others, like and Chris and everybody, like it's it's fantastic how responsive you all are, but it's still really, really scary to to get started. Um, and so, so my my sort of vision for this is like, okay, if it's something where you have your credit card and you, you go onto a website and you, you, here's my credit card, give me one, uh, which is completely within the realm of possibility and like not even years out, I mean like you could build this thing in two months. Um, that's a very different kind of context for adoption in the discovery solution space than, okay, now you have to figure out how to run open source software and that, that can just be very, very difficult in terms of the barrier. That's very true. I think, though, that there is then the other point is that the, some vendors, at least, make it seem like uh, a discovery service is actually pretty expensive. So if you do something too cheaply, it must be somehow really bad or something. Yeah, so, that, that's a tricky pattern. Um, it's definitely true. If I may just add a comment about uh, the way in the park service we're now working with Viewfind. And I've given Damien a heads up on it, and we'll send him a PowerPoint when we're ready with a presentation. And maybe next year we'll talk more about it. But within the park service, there are lots of different databases, lots of independent initiatives. And now we're adapting Viewfind to essentially integrate them. Nice. So, nice. And mostly uh, what we're emphasizing is uh, links to digital assets. So the link always goes to the home page, you know, of the home system. So in, the, in a sense, within our organization, we're doing something like what the Digital Public Library of America or Europeana are doing on a much larger scale. So that's, 
that's where I see the interesting, you know, very interesting possibilities. Definitely, and, and part of part of the design consideration for thinking about something like this was was how can we make it just as customizable as it is right now, um, with, without like compromising the integrity of a of a centralized service. And I, I think there are actually some really good solutions and sort of map some of those things out so that you can use it in any way that you need to without necessarily conflicting with the service model. So. How am I doing for time? Am I way over? We've got five minutes. Okay, five minutes for any other questions or comments. Yeah, uh, Damien. I've been getting really excited about what we're producing, and so like, what are you using for this? You know, and so there is some interest there, and kind of using that with um, to get more people on board, the ones that are kind of the late adopters, by seeing what we're putting on there now, and then they can kind of feel a little bit of that peer pressure to get everybody moving in the right direction. Definitely. So the comment was was about uh, sort of peer pressure through finding early adopters and so on, and, and Damien like went way far and beyond what I thought he would do um, when I first floated this idea to him. And he, he uh, sort of got me connected with some folks who are really interested in this kind of thing. Uh, and in fact, if, if I had built something, I think they would have used it. Um, and so the issue really was on my end in that case, is that I, I couldn't follow through. And so rather than sort of keep things going, I kind of had to s just make it very clear that I couldn't continue. So um, those people are there. Those institutions are there. And they're, they're basically ready to take a look at this uh, whenever it's available or even just to partner and advise. Um, they definitely are, are basically ready and willing to, to contribute. So early adopters are out there. Well, here's a question. Do you see value to, um, to an individual institution using these ideas for their own, um, you know, for their own deployment? Um, or do you see mm -hmm. that the, the main value is once you get once you get past an individual institution, can really commoditize it? I think it's entirely dependent on context. Okay. Um, my, my gut, and so, so the, if I were just to have a heuristic for this, I'd say no, don't do it. Um, and the, the reason kind of is playing into the, the comparison between the startup world and the institutional world. The cost of doing cloud or the cost of doing platform as a service the cost of doing anything like anything along those lines is really, really high the first time. And so unless it's part of the strategic priorities of the university uh, and, or the institution to move in that direction, to actually start like really uh, uh, taking advantage of the benefit of learning that knowledge and learning that space, uh -huh. it becomes really, really difficult to support it going forward, uh, especially when it comes to hire people. Because now you're, you're making a conscious decision between two different worlds. Do we hire people who can help us with running servers and data centers and managing virtual machines um, and that kind of skill set or are we like tapping into people who are like really interested in this platform space I'm finding that there are kind of few and far in between like who actually like navigate both those spaces uh -huh. so uh, how do you how do you feel about that response how does that does that clarify the question or does it well it, it fits pretty well with um, something we're sort of struggling with which is how you know we have all of these applications we have a strong culture of running everything in house mm -hmm. everything is a kind of a boutique and things are either deployed uh, in this kind of boutique way um, or maybe uh, deployed in you know sort of use, using kind of different uh, perhaps different manual methods and so just even you know, even making sure everything is documented is a kind of onerous thing and so we're trying to think a bit about well how do we how do we get that under control because you know we're always being asked to do more and yes. of course when you're asked to do more you don't really get to stop doing old things right yeah and on top of yeah. that like it often is the case that the improvement efforts that become available to you are actually already legacy yeah so you're, yeah, you're, yeah. you're ready to like make the improvement and do the work, and it's actually the technology that was, and the, the 
practices that were created five years ago that were really effective five years ago is, is this kind of idea that you have to go where the puck is going to be. Uh, and that's, right. kind of, that's kind of difficult. Right. And so, yeah, so we're, we're sort of try, trying to get people to think, how do we, um, you know, how do we start automat automating deploys? What, kind of, what kinds of um, frameworks can we use so that we get good at them and can uh, uh, spin things up and provide more um, more redundancy, more backup for each other. Um, yeah, there there are a lot of ways to navigate this space, yeah. and, and actually, what what I'll say right now is I'm I'm super interested in that conversation. Uh -huh. um, so if if you want to uh, ping me on Twitter or um, uh, you can get my email address probably through Damien or someone, uh, th th that's an interesting conversation to have. And I, I actually like, I have a really soft spot in my heart for institutions, which is kind of why I was interested in this space. Because I know how painful this is, um, and just as an aside, like one of one of the approaches that you can take is, uh, you can create cent new centers of gravity in new practices. That that's completely legitimate. It just has to be a deliberate, sort of intentional design of you know, your overarching strategy, uh, not exactly. sort of uh, we happen to use this new tool now what, uh, which unfortunately is, is oftentimes the case, especially when things are sold to you to do things a certain way. Um, yep. Or if you have a number of sort of disparate efforts that aren't really looking at how do we use common infrastructure. Yeah. M my biggest concern in this space is actually people. Um, yeah. Because when you do new things, that's a very threatening thing. Mm -hmm. And it's really, really hard to navigate that space well and carefully, compassionately, empathetically, um, and find ways to enable people instead of sort of isolate them back in this old legacy space, even if you're creating new, wonderful, whatever's over here, um, it's, I think it's really, really important to bring people along for the ride and to do that in a way that's, that's very thoughtful. That's sort of, uh, I guess, my, my empathy aside for the day. But thanks, Todd. Yeah, and feel free to reach out to me. Anybody really is, I'm always interested in talking about this stuff. Um, do you have any time for one more? Yeah, I don't want to get in your way.